Thanks for pressing play. This is Christopher Lockhead, Follow Your Different, where we aspire to have real conversations that celebrate the people, ideas, and companies that stand out. We're sponsored by the good folks at Oracle NetSuite. Learn how to turbocharge the growth of your business today at netsuite.com slash different. And while you're there, you will be able to set up a free one-hour growth review with an expert in your industry. That's netsuite.com slash different. On this episode, the author of what I believe is a groundbreaking new book, a book that will more than likely go down as one of the top business books of 2019. Uh, the book is called Loon Shots. That is to say, uh, uh, a moonshot by a lunatic. <laughs> Loon Shots. And the author is the amazing Safi Bacall. Safi is a second generation physicist and he's a biotech entrepreneur and he's got a PhD from Stanford. And he's a uh, guy who started a company and took it public and, and did that whole ride. Uh, and now he's written this incredible book. We have. You know, and I got to tell you, we have a conversation that to me is emblematic of why podcasts are legendary. Because the only way you can really get into meeting a guy like this and hanging out with a guy like this is to sit down and have a conversation with him. And that's what we do. And you get to experience that amazing conversation. Hopefully it's the conversation you would want to have with Safi. Um, we talk about how crazy people and ideas lead to breakthroughs, this thing he calls a loon shot. We unpack how serendipity and genius need to come together at that right moment to create a breakthrough. Why we need to pay more attention to uh, the structure of a company or organization than the culture. Safi has a very uh, provocative idea about that. What organizations need to do to nurture crazy ideas and people for that matter and create an environment for them to flourish. And we even dig into stuff like how English became a dominant language and why Western European culture thrives in so much uh, of the world and a ton more. This is an awesome conversation. Um, so, uh, listen, you can check out the show the sh notes, <laughs> the show notes at lockhead.com. Uh, and the key takeaways from this episode and where you can get a hold of uh, Dr. Bacall and his new incredible book. Now, without any further ado, hey ho, let's go. Just imagine a glass of water. You stick your finger in a glass of water, you can swish it around. All the molecules are just sloshing. Except as I lower the temperature, all of a sudden at one critical temperature, boom, the behavior of those molecules totally changes. They become completely rigid. The water freezes, becomes ice. So why? The molecules inside are exactly the same. So how did they notice suddenly change? Why would all these molecules suddenly change at the same exact time? And notice there's no leader molecule, no CEO molecule with a bullhorn saying, I, you know, I think you should be liquid too. Wait a minute. Let me go check the temperature. No, I think, I think you're about right. What, wait, wait a little bit. Oh, no, we're at 32. Now we're at 32. Boom. Everybody go. You should be solid. There's no leader molecule. It just happens. And that's the idea of a collective product property that emerges out of the dynamics of the whole. And it's a kind of a different way of thinking about the world around us that Large groups can completely change behavior, and it has nothing to do with a leader telling them to. It has nothing to do with, you know, the culture. It has nothing to do, you know, there's no manual saying, I think we should all be loosey-goosey sloshing around. You know, let's all read that manual and let's try to be loosey-goosey sloshing. No, there's nothing to do with culture. And it's also what's even more interesting, it's nothing to do with an individual property. There's no such thing as a water molecule that's kind of a liquid or a water molecule that's kind of a solid. The same water molecule can be either. So when you translate that into the business world or a team world or company world or any kind of organization, you know, I think I, one of the ways I first got started on this project was when I first became an entrepreneur, I was, I was relatively young. I think I was in my early 30s the first time. CEO, Wait, what? 
Way young way, in your thirties. <laughs> way young in my thirties, and uh, yeah, first time CEO. I, I mean, you know, I'm, I know in Silicon Valley, there's obviously a lot younger, but um, I, you know, I didn't have a ton of experience, and I read everything I could find. I just got every article or book, you know, how to be, a, you know, a good leader, how to build a great team, great company, and you know, achieve your big mission, empower employees, and so on. And they all. Uh, <clears throat> they all talked about culture. It was, it was all stuff that sort of sounded good. You know, you read it. It's a little like astrology. You know, you read, oh yeah, that describes me. Oh yeah, that describes me. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. And all these books on culture, like, yeah, empower employees. That's how, you know, do this thing. That's on. all these things sound good. But after a while you get sort of hungry for something more solid. And the, uh, that's what was so, interesting to you. I was trying to understand if there's some kind of science to this. Is there something else besides just culture? Because you would see companies with completely different cultures succeed and companies with the same cultures fail. So is it really culture? And you have said you think culture is over, uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but overemphasized vis-a-vis structure. Is that, am I remembering this right? Yeah, that's right. I think you see, it's not that there are aspects of let's call by culture let's say we mean the patterns of behavior between groups of people and of course there are elements of culture that are very important you know in 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 groups or teams where there's where you celebrate victories where people trust each other those are good things in groups or teams where there's you know they start the morning with a public beating it's probably not going to be a very happy company so there are clearly some better cultures and some worse cultures But the interesting thing about that I find is uh, I have known companies who have that absolute, you know, the beatings will continue until morale improves kind of culture and places I would never want to work. It just seemed like, you know, stacked with assholes. And yet some companies with that culture are very successful. And then, you know, you see these happy West Coasty kumbaya, everybody loves each other. And, you know, there are companies like that that are hugely successful and there's a lot of them that never go anywhere. And so, I sort of, that sort of resonated with me. It's like, huh, there are things to learn about culture for sure. I think, you know, the Drucker quote, culture eats strategy for breakfast is, is, is worth paying a lot of attention to. But at the same time, as a leader, um, it's, there's no culture that works and culture that doesn't. That's, that's what it seems to me. But how how does that seem to you, particularly in this concept of creating loon shots? Yeah. And I think the, the point that, well, (laughs) to that, Quote, I've often had it when, when people, you know, there is that saying in business, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I think what I would add is that structure eats culture for lunch. That's awesome. Could you say that one more time for me? <laughs> well, there's a saying in business that culture eats strategy for breakfast. What I would add is that structure eats culture for lunch. I love it. So if I'm a leader and I say, hey, listen, I'm, I'm kind of signing up to Safi's idea of, of loon shots. And actually I should probably have you define a loon shot for me, but um, I want to be a company. I want to be a person that is involved with real breakthroughs. You know, I, I personally am somebody Safi who's tried to spend most of my working life on things that I would call today. I would characterize as exponential difference as opposed to incremental betters incremental doesn't interest me. I know there's a role for that. I know it can be incredibly important. So I don't, I'm not shitting on incremental betters. There's a lot of goodness and, you know, your iPhone gets a little better every release and, you know, braking systems and cars get incrementally better and that's all cool and important and all that. But I'm somebody who's drawn to the exponential, the, the loon shot, so to speak. And so, um, why do you, what, is, what is it about structure that enables this maybe in a way that you think culture doesn't as much? Well, let's talk about, let's talk about incentives because I, I think culture obviously has some elements that do make sense. But I think what we miss is the structure. I'll just give you an example that I was uh, talking about with a friend of mine at uh, uh, Uber. And before the CEO transition that happened uh, uh, maybe two, was it two years ago, I don't remember, um, there was this, people talked about in the engineering group there, there was this culture where everyone is the captain of their own speedboat. Everyone is like trying to do this huge success on their own project and nobody's helping anybody out. And that was the culture. And, the, you know, they, 
it didn't matter how much they talked about, you know, Kumbaya and everybody help each other out. That was the culture. So what, if you look at the incentive, if you peel back the incentive, something that's really interesting and not talked about as much is that Uber had a real outlier incentive system. So for example, most of the companies in Silicon Valley or peer companies, you'd have some bonus target. And depending on how you perform that year, you'd get, you know, 50% or 80% or 130%, maybe as much as, you know, 150% of your target. On the other hand, at Uber, it got up to 8x. So what did that structure do for people? Nobody wanted to work on other people's projects. All they wanted to do is find some, like whether it's Uber Eats or Uber Hospital or Uber, some project that they could run with and point to, this was entirely me, it wasn't anybody else, so they could earn that 8x. And it, it really wouldn't matter how many times you'd pat somebody in the back and say, help each other out. Cause in the back of their mind, they're like, look, I could make eight X if I just go get my own thing and prove that I grew this little, little seed into a big, big flower, big, when they ch changed, they came in and they made it a little more team based. Like you have rewards that are based on how your team does and they're more team driven. And all of a sudden the culture changed. What does that mean? It means structure eats culture for lunch. It means the underlying structure can drive the culture yes. Yes. rather than the other way around. You know, as a former public company executive, one of the things that I think doesn't get talked about as a powerful positive thing is, uh, and it was just true in my experience, when you and I have stock options, or restricted stock or whatever it is. We have some kind of instrument that is aligned to uh, increasing the value of the company over time, point A. And point B, when I was a CMO, the vast majority of my compensation was predicated on the success of the business. Did we meet our quarterly projections, uh, et cetera? And you know, some percentage of my bonus, maybe 20% was, was a function of my area of responsibility in marketing, but the vast majority of the top 10 people in the company their compensation was tied to the performance of the company. And uh, look, I'm not a compensation expert at all, but, but what I do know is if we're all aligned on, hey, listen, we only have one fucking stock price around here, right? And the vast majority of your compensation and my compensation is tied to the increase in the value of the company, then I don't know, that has been a structural incentive program, if I could call it that, that I have seen work very well. But I'm curious as to your thoughts. I think that makes a lot of sense, but it, it depends on the size. Now, let's say, for example, you have a 100,000 person company. All right. Now, if you're one of the top five officers, you're the CEO and we have the CMO and the CFO and one of the COO and one of the top five, you know, it does make sense that your equity is tied to the value of the company because you want that entire le leadership team to be working well as a team and incentivized to make the company go up. Now let's go eight levels down and uh, you know, maybe it's a manufacturing company. There's some guy designing a coffee machine way down there. And the question is what almost all companies do today is like, well, let's just write everybody a, you know, a check. You get stock options. That's great. And the question is, what does it do for that guy eight levels down? Not the five people on the top, but the guy eight levels down who's working on a coffee machine. And I say guy, but it could be, you know, obviously. Guy, gal, doesn't matter. Vice president, someone working on a project that really, let's say they really bust their ass and work really hard and they build one of the top 5% coffee machines of the year. It wins a bunch of awards. How much does it move the needle of the company? Let's say, you know, the coffee machine sells 50 million a year, but if the company is selling 5 billion, right. it, it, it moves his stock option by not even 1%. Yep. So what is that stock option doing for him? Nothing. In economics, that would be called a free rider bonus. It a means- A free rider bonus? It's a free rider. Like you can get on a bus without paying anything because other people are paying for it. So you could work very hard on your project or 
you can just sit there, twiddle your thumbs and try to convince your boss that you're important. And if somebody else makes the stock go up, then you're going to get that benefit. Yeah. So that's kind of a free rider problem. You're not really being compensated on your output of what you're supposed to be putting your heart and soul into and what the company would like you to be putting your heart and soul into. And what- so the bigger the organization, the more the incentive has to be tied more to what that individual is actually producing, you think? Well, I think you want to kind of the message of this book is we have just not addressed this problem well enough. Hmm. We are spending yeah. companies and teams, they're like, you know what, let's hire a, a, you know, a six figure superstar expert chief technology officer to make sure everybody has the latest app on their iPhone or Android and superstar. And, and by the way, the HR system will be the same thing that, you know, we were doing in the 19th century, sort of payroll and this and that. And if, uh, you know, if the company has a good year already, every check for 10% or, you know what, if I'm sophisticated, let's just give everybody a stock option and, and then call it a day. Yeah. So you spend all this time and energy on a CTO, you know, to be 21st century. And then your incentive system designs, which is ultimately your structure is 19th century. Yeah. So why is that? Which do you care more about? Having people motivated and their passion directed and rewarded appropriate and commensurate with the value that they're really adding or that they have the latest gadget in their pocket when they're wandering around. Yeah. So I, I would say we've got our priorities wrong place. I see. Yeah, that's right. I'm not saying it's an easy problem to solve. It's a hard problem to solve. You know what? It's absolutely cheaper, easier and faster to get a, you know, one person in HR that writes a payroll check and then just forget about it. If you're a manager, no difficult discussions. Hey, we had a bad year. Nobody gets a bonus. Bye-bye. Yep. <laughs> or we had a good year. Everybody gets 10%. Bye-bye. Yep. Easy discussion. But how motivating is that? You just created the free rider problem everywhere. Everybody might as well twiddle a thumb and see if it was a good year or not. Well, in, in some of these companies, it's like working there is almost socialism in that sense, right? And so it, it, all I try to do is not get fired. And as long as the company does well, then you know, I do well and away we go. But I, I don't know, my experience in talking to you know, many, many people about this is that's hugely disempowering. I think most quality people want some kind of environment where I want the team to do really well. And if I do really well, I want me to do really well. And I, there's got to be a connection between those things for sure. But to your point, if there's 100,000 people in the organization, the free rider thing is not, even if the company's doing really well, hey, honey, you know, the stock's up or we all got a 20% bonus this year, whatever, that feels great. But I also, for my own self-actualization, I need to feel like I'm contributing and that I'm somehow part of making a difference. Right. I, we're saying exactly the same thing. I think it's companies are just under-investing in aligning rewards and effort on an individual, but they're just under investing in that they're over investing in things that don't matter. Like, you know, the latest app or the latest tools and technology. The probably the number one, most important thing is to have really motivated employees. What's yeah. kind of what's more to than what's more important than that. And, you know, I don't want to give the wrong impression that everything is purely financial rewards by rewards. There's two kinds. There's the financial and there's the non-financial and how much each person cares about. That's what makes it even more tricky is that how much each person cares about those two actually varies. Yeah. Some people really care more about the financial. Some people are really driven by, you know, what are called the intrinsic motivators. And, and I know a lot of people like that. I'm actually a lot like that too. I want to feel that I'm growing. I want to feel that whatever goal that I've set that firstly, I'm excited about that goal. Secondly, I can see myself making progress against that goal that's tangible and meaningful. And third, that I can see my skills improving. Yeah. Those are all intrinsic motivators. And fourth, you want to be recognized, recognized by your peers. All, none of those are tangible financial. Those are all intangible rewards. Yep. So when I say rewards, and we need to think more carefully about and invest more in making sure people's efforts are tied better to their rewards in order to get everybody as motivated as we can possibly be. I mean, not just financial. I mean, what are we doing to recognize their success? What are we doing to customize their work effort so that they're stretched neither too much nor too little? 
But if they're stretched too little, that's not really yeah. satisfying. If they're stretched too much, that's deeply unsatisfying in a different way. So it's a very you know tricky balance to get the string just right. Yeah. And if we place all of those burdens on a person's manager, a person might have five, 10 re- direct reports or 10 or 15 or whatever. That's a lot of stuff. I mean, you have to coordinate a group, put out fires, figure out where you're going, manage a tactical plan, report on, re- but you've got five, 10 or 15 people that you really need to see. Are they really genuinely stretch not too much or not too little are they really being recognized in the way that's best for them whether it's financial or none that's a lot of stuff for one human manager to try to figure out and p.s he's not going to get the truth right as you know whenever you've been inside a lot kind of the last person to get the truth is the manager why because their direct reports are scared of him or her and it doesn't matter how great the culture is uh, and you can have the best culture in the world. It's simply a fact that if you are talking to the person who will be determining your bonus that year, are you going to be 100% upfront with what you're worried about, what you're scared about, where you think you screwed up, where you think your boss is screwing up? Uh, Maybe um, not. Never. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it would take a hell of, it would take that Wonder Woman with that magic lasso. <laughs> the truth telling lasso. That's right. That's right. I just saw that movie again yesterday. Oh, but um, I have a hard time with these new ones because to me, Adam West is Batman. Yeah. And Linda Carter is Wonder Woman. <laughs> <laughs> I do see Linda Carter. It's a little disconcerting, but I like this new one better, to be honest. Yeah. Wow, you're breaking my heart here. I grew up in love with Linda Carter. Uh, well, I'll she's tell you a side story. When I was uh, yeah. a kid, you know, I had superhero posters in the in the bedroom, right? And so I had a, a poster of Wonder Woman in her Wonder Woman outfit. And, and one day my grandfather, whose name was Jack, and he was from Scotland, so he had this, you know, the Scottish accent. He comes in, he sees this giant poster of Linda Carter and the Wonder Woman outfit in my bedroom. And I'm a kid, what do I know, right? And he looks at it and he says, Christopher, how would you like to have her for your babysitter? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, that's fun. Uh, so I, apparently my grandfather, Jack, liked her too, <laughs> but I yeah. digress. Yeah, uh, well, this one is, uh, this, anyway. So, you know, this thing's an interesting thing because one of the things I find in business today, Safi, that's really interesting is, particularly in larger companies, less so in startups, a lot of people today don't seem to know what a result is. And they sort of confuse the activity contest with results. And one of the things I've thought a lot about is, Leaders have to do a better job of making it clear what are the results that we're looking for. Uh, Is is this sort of direction where you're at or how should I think about this in the context of sort of knowing what a result is? No, I think uh, that's an excellent question because you, you can't motivate somebody if they don't know what their goal is. Yeah. You can't just say, well, look, I'm going to reward you if you work hard. What does that mean? You want me to, be at my desk and look busy. First, I need to know what the goal is. And second, they need, you need to have a, a very, if you really want to be fair uh, and motivate your employees to the maximum and figure out how to optimize the motivation, it, there's a lot of really tricky things. So for example, suppose you set a goal of, you know, achieve X in sales. And uh, the employee doesn't. So if you just have a system, well, the target was X, you achieved X minus 20%. So your pay is X minus 20%. Well, if you go into that guy's head, if he knew that he was kind of slacking off during the quarter of the year, and he was like, you know what, I was out having beers with my pals at three o'clock, you know, half the time, then I'd be like, yeah, okay, I, I get, got it. Now suppose what ha- same exact outcome, but what happened was that the product he got delivered from the manufacturing group just had all these flaws in it. And like half the stuff had to be sent back. So his customers were incredibly pissed at him because the product was late. And he, not only did he Worked just he actually worked twice as hard. He stayed, worked till like eight o'clock on nights 
you know, God knows how many nights in a row just to calm these people down who actually wanted to cancel 100% of their orders. And he saved it by getting it up to 80%. Same right. exact result. 80% so of context target. really matters. Right. So leadership is very tricky because you want to be just sticking absolutely without any context to a result can be very demotivating. Yes. Yeah, we have to factor that context. So let's go to loon shot, uh, this term. What, what do you mean by a loon shot? And why should I, as a in my career or as a business leader, an entrepreneur, why would I want to be somebody who makes loon shots happen? <laughs> sure. Well, everybody knows what a moon shot is with an M. But the big breakthroughs, the one that changed the course of science or business and history, and they rarely arrive with you know, blaring trumpets and red carpets dazzling everyone with their brilliance. Usually they show up covered in warts, which are those either early stage failures or kind of obvious reasons that everybody says they'll never work. And their champions are often dismissed as crazy. And that's why I call them moonshots rather than moonshots. So here's my big sort of question about this. I, I have a theory and I want to test it on you and see if it fits with your thinking in the book. So I've had this theory for quite a while, which is at a high level, and it's oversimplification, but you know, I'm not that smart. So at a high level, there's two kinds of people in business. There are what you could think of as a breaker and creator, somebody who breaks the old thing and creates a new thing. And then there's somebody who you could think of as a manager and a grower and rarely is that the same person. Sometimes, of course, and we all have components of both. You know, I'm not the shittiest manager in the world, but I'm not a great manager. I'm more of a breaker and creator than I am a manager and grower. And if you look at, you know, take a company we all know today, if you, you look at, you know, Cook at Apple, he's much more of a manager and a grower. Steve Jobs was, of course, much more of a breaker and a creator. So if you accept that for a sec, and you can shit on it or not accept it if you, if you want, but if you accept it for a sec, the thing that's always interested me as it relates to these giant breakthroughs, these loon shots, is the people who make breakthroughs and loon shots, i.e. the breakers and creators, tend to make the managers and the growers absolutely insane because they don't want their shit broken and created. They're managing this shit, right? So if I'm at Microsoft and I'm in charge of Microsoft Office, I don't want a group of people over here, quote unquote, reimagining the future of office productivity. Go fuck yourself. I'm just trying to grow what we already got. And so how do you think about this dynamic tension between sort of managing and growing a business and, you know, rolling a fatty and coming up with a big loon shot idea and making that happen? Uh, okay. By the way, I should, I, I want to go back to the first thing you said, because I, I just had this odd thing that I've always noticed that people who start by saying, you know, I'm, I'm really not very smart, are almost inevitably smarter than the people who say exactly the opposite. It's exactly the other way, 180 degrees, <laughs> in my little experience. Um, but anyways, how do you make, so I, the way I think about it a little bit is the artists and the soldiers. And that was, uh, uh, you know, in one of the kind of the immediate spark that, launched this particular this project was when I was asked to work with uh, President Obama's Council of Science Advisors and I was you know, running a company and I had no connection to politics or science or science policy uh, you know, in the federal government. I just happened to have a guy who uh, was running that group and I'd known him in college. I'd been a TA for Called me up, said, will you join? Flew down there and the first day they said, your job is to write the next generation of the Vannevar Bush report. And I had never heard of Vannevar Bush or his report. And I, uh, we had like three months to prepare a recommendation for the president. So I had to do some fast reading. And I found out that he was a guy who had been a uh, dean of engineering at MIT at the start of World War II. He quit his job, talked his way into a meeting with FDR, and had a 10-minute meeting that probably changed the course of the World War II more than any other such meeting. Why am I telling you this story? Because you talked about the kind of managers, the growers, and the, the, the builders versus the creatives who are designing the next new thing. So Bush got there was a national crisis because he knew, as he told President Roosevelt, 
that the U.S. lagged far behind Nazi Germany in crucial new technologies, the ones that would turn the course of war. And he said, we're going to lose this war. And he was right. The Nazis said the U-boats that were ready to strangle the Atlantic, the planes of the Luftwaffe that was ready to bomb, uh, ready to um, bomb Europe into submission, which it did. And they discovered this thing called nuclear fission, which splitting the atom, which put Hitler within reach of nuclear weapons. So Bush was faced with the same problem that you just described. The military were these, I think you called them the managers growers, but essentially they viewed the war as let's build more guns, more ships, more planes, more guns, more ships, more planes, more of. And it's kind of a well-known case that, a well-known statement that generals plan to fight the current war with the tools and technology of the previous war. And this time, Bush calculated the results would be a disaster if we did that, because he was right. Technology had improved, and if he hadn't stepped in, we probably would have lost that war, and the world would look very different. So he said, what can you do about this problem? The one that you just described, you have these, whether they're managers, growers, or soldiers who want just more of, and the creatives. And the answer is, number one, separate them. The military had been saying, well, you know, giving a, a lip speak to, well, we want to have innovation inside. We want to have these great scientists inside. We want to have a research lab inside. And they did have all these things. Just whenever it rose up uh, to more senior levels, the ideas got shot down over and over again. So nothing really important came through. So first of all, you have to separate it and create a completely different home. So you can't have the artists working for the soldiers. Because what I found in my career is if you, do, if you don't do that, the two groups make each other absolutely batshit. Right. You know, and, and I know in my work as an advisor, um, there's a huge percentage of the company when I show up that uh, I'm absolutely Satan. Because what I represent is fucking up everything they're currently doing. And they want to do everything possible to undermine it because – they're committed to the way that it is. They feel like they get to, to our whole point of discussion on structure and compensation. They get compensated to make the current thing better. And I show up and say, fuck that. Let's do something completely different. And they're like, get him out. Yeah. And that, so there's, there's two pieces to that is, except that that is always the case in every company, in every organization, there's the job of the artists and there's the job of the soldiers. And if you want to be a great company, you absolutely have to have both. So, and they won't like each other. It, it's just a fact. It's just, it's, you know, it, it will never happen. That, just get over that. They, artists are artists and they're creative souls and they, they make some beautiful baby and they think this is the most beautiful baby ever invented. And they show it to the soldier or the marketing guy or whatever. And the guy's like, you've got to be kidding me. None of my customers are going to buy that. I won't make my commission. And that's the same Nobody's conversation. Nobody's asking for that. Nobody's ever even heard of it. I don't even know what word you just use. Like, I, what, you know, it's like it's simple things. Like I think about sort of the, the invention of the DVR, originally the category pioneered by TiVo, right? When I first heard about that, I'm like, I don't, I don't need that. I don't know how to watch TV. I don't, today, I can't even imagine. I, I don't know about you, but if you ever go to like a hotel room or whatever, they don't have it. And like there's commercials on, you're like, what the? F yeah. And then, of course, the, the whole concept of like, hey, look, I want to watch what I want to watch when I want to watch. Today, that whole paradigm is a broken paradigm, but roll the clock back 10, 15 years ago. And we didn't need a DVR. We didn't need streaming. We didn't, there was no such thing as a, a, um, a binge viewing or, or, or listening, right? And so Absolutely. the whole world moves from the way it is to the way the creator, in your words, the artist, but the, the people who are in charge with managing the way that it is, they fucking hate that new thing. <laughs> well, that, the, you have to start by understanding and accepting that, for example, men and women, they're never going to be the same. You can't make them the same. That's, and it's not even pleasant if they're the same. <laughs> well, and Part thank of the, God. The exactly. The first thing I love about my wife is that yeah. she's a woman. Exactly. Yeah, that's the whole vive la différence, right? It's yes. the enjoy the difference. And so that's, a, firstly, at the level of the artist and soldier, you want to celebrate, you want to start by mutual respect and understanding 
that might be the spouse that might be, and you know what? They are totally different than you. And not only is that okay, it's awesome. Would, you know, would you want, if you're a completely creative person who's in the lab building wild new technologies all the time, would you want you manufacturing them and getting the quality right with a 99%? No, you'd, you'd do a terrible no. job. Can I and tell you a little, little side story about this? Yeah, yeah. So for about a year or so, I've been getting these allergy shots. I've been allergic to dogs and cats and animals my whole life. My wife wants cats. So guess who's getting allergy shots? And uh, by the way, it's an incredible thing because it's not a drug. They do this test on you and they stick you with all the stuff you are allergic to. In my case, it was like 80 some odd pricks in your back and they look at what you react to. And then they build a concoction of all the shit you're allergic to. And they, they shove that into your arm once a week for a period of years. And now they're kitty cats in the fucking bed. Anyway, <laughs> no, really. <laughs> It's crazy. Tell me how you really feel. Tell me how you really feel about that, by the way. <laughs> Thelma, we, we have, we have, we have, uh, uh, they're sisters. We adopted these wild kitty cats, these feral cats. And of course, we, they're girl, girls, sisters, and we named them Thelma and Louise. And now fucking Thelma sleeps on my feet. Wow. But um, so anyway, long story way longer. I go to this clinic once a week for these shots. And there are these nurses that give you these shots, right? And they're only, they're all open for certain hours and they need half an hour of observation time before they let you go. So you get your shot, you sit there, you listen to half an hour of a podcast, if you're me, and then they call your name, they ask you if you're okay, they look at the, the place where they gave you the shot in the arm, and then you leave. And so you have to have this half hour. So anyway, when I was first in this therapy, I showed up and they shut for lunch at noon. And I showed up at 11.32, Safi. <laughs> and then guess what the nurse behind the thing said to me? Can't have your shot. You need to come back when we reopen it too. And I was just, and I was polite to her, but I, in my mind, I was like, you know, fuck, this is bullshit. And anyway, as I'm getting in my car and leaving, I had this aha and the aha was, hey, you know what? I'm stoked that she's that anal because the person that I want shooting my body full of shit that makes me sick I need that person to be all about the details, super anal and on it. That's exactly who I want in this job. I don't want exactly. some freewheeling maniac like myself just saying, oh, well, I'm not sure what we gave you last week, but I just figured we'd try this and see how you do. <laughs> exactly. Take, just extend that. Let's say you're in the military or, and it's, it's exactly the same. Apply to any, any company, but since we're on World War II, let's say you're coming up for radical new technologies for planes. You want the guy in the lab who's like inventing stuff and, you know, eight out of 10 of the things that he invents just blows up in the lab. But, the, you know, that's kind of what you want him to do because to try, you just need a lot of trial and error. Now go over across the street where they're assembling those planes. Do you want the same kind of guy who will just put 10 planes in the air and then sit back and see which eight fall out of the sky? No, you want the anal person like the nurse that you had that was injecting you with that allergy meds. You want them making sure every single screw is tied this tight and not that tight and not too loose. You want them as anal as possible. You don't want eight planes falling out of the sky. You want zero falling out of the sky. So, so not isn't it's it fascinating that we want the crazies to come up with the insane ideas and maybe do the first pass at pressure testing these ideas. But once it looks like this is a thing we want to invest in or go further with, then we need the more analytical, the more thorough, the more manager, the more an analytical types to button the shit down, do the quality management, m m to your point, make sure the planes don't fall out of the sky. And, and we do sort of have to love each other like yin and yang. It's, a, it's vive la différence, but inside a company. Yeah. You want to celebrate the differences. So the first thing is you got to start by celebrating the differences because you need both of those two things to succeed. An idea doesn't just go from the lab to something that customers pay for and reorder and reorder. It needs both those sides. You need the product, you need the idea for the product and the creative difference, and then you need all of the execution and operational excellence to get it to the customer on time, on spec, on budget. So you need God, I both. wish I'd had this conversation with you when I was 25. <laughs> <laughs> it's very frustrating because, you know, people think they're speaking the same language. They might both be speaking English, but they're not. They're coming from totally different. When 
the artist goes back, he or she is hanging out with other artist friends. And what do they talk about? How beautiful their idea is. Not about the fact that they just had 20 ideas and 19 of them blew up, but they talk about the one that's beautiful. Yes. Whereas the soldiers go back and they talk about, I just made 20 things and I had zero out of 20 failures. Really, I had one, so you're a little less cool than the rest. You know, right. it's exactly the opposite. So when you take two of them from these two different worlds, they're just, they think they're both speaking English, but they're not. They're speaking very different languages, things that they value, the way they talk about failure and about, you know, risk is a good word for one of them. It's a bad word for the other. Yeah. So even though it's the same English word, it's not really the same language. It comes loaded with their, so you have these two groups. You have to start number one with vive la difference, celebrating the difference. Yeah. But number two, when there is a dispute, sometimes they can resolve, but that's really the job of the leader. So what it really means is there's a different mindset of a leader that's needed today, especially because innovation and the pace of innovation is faster and faster and faster. It means that you have to reject this idea or this myth that the leader is this sort of genius Moses with the technology that stands on top of a mountain and tells you what will work and what won't. That absolutely, it can work for a little while, but it's not sustainable. It will always crash and burn. The and really great, sorry, yeah. go ahead, don't, go ahead, go ahead, please. The, the truly great leaders are much less like that Moses on the top of the mountain telling you what will or won't work. They're much more like careful gardeners and their number one job is the balance between the artists and the soldiers. That's their job. So when yeah. you come into a company, if you're, you know, the crazy wacky artist guy is going to come in and insert 20 new ideas, obviously the other artists, I mean, they, they, they may or may not like your ideas, but the soldiers will be exactly like you say. Firstly, they're not really speaking your language. Secondly, their incentive systems are off because whatever new idea you have, it's not going to work as well as the older one. They're going to have to spend a lot of time learning it. Their commissions are going to go down because customers aren't going to buy it as much at first, et cetera, et cetera. So it's the job of the leader to recognize that and ease that process on manage the transfer and the dynamics between the two. Less about getting into the weeds on one side or getting into the weeds on the other side, but yes. more about the transfer between the two. And I find myself in this conversation a lot. I don't do very much advisor or consulting stuff anymore, just a smidgen. But uh, I, I was recently in a conversation with a very high profile tech company. And they said to me they wanted to produce a big breakthrough. They wanted to design and dominate a whole new category. The current category they were in, although they were doing well, was becoming more commoditized and attracting more competition. And they wanted to take, you know, it, they didn't use this word, but they wanted to create a loon shot, right? And they wanted to do the kind of marketing and what I would call category design in order to do that. So we have this conversation. I had fucking zero chemistry with the CEO and I knew it wasn't going to go anywhere. And uh, what they ended up doing was they fucking hired a what I would call classic uh, professorial management consulting type set of folks to come in and help them do this. And look, I could give a fuck because I'm, you know, mostly retired from doing that work. But I'm sitting there going, you know, for a smart guy, meaning the CEO of this company, you're really fucking stupid because you hired these people because you like that they're very process oriented and they're going to have all these fucking meetings and they're going to do all these fucking workshops and they're going to socialize the idea, and, you know, and they're going to drive consensus and all these things. And guess what that's going to get you? incremental more of the fucking same and what you said you wanted to do was to produce a breakthrough and so i just find you know having been in a million of these conversations for years it's so funny that a, a lot of these anal folks will hire very sort of conservative like nobody hires fucking mckinsey to do a breakthrough sorry mckin and it wasn't mckinsey in this case but that's just not what McKinsey fucking does, right? But then it, somehow they think, oh, yes, well, we'll hire McKinsey. They'll do some analysis and they'll tell us this is what we should do. When in point of fact, that might be helpful if you want to improve your margins by two percentage points or whether or not you should or shouldn't enter the Iceland geography for your shit. But it, it, McKinsey's not going to help you produce a loon shot in the SAFI kind of definition, at least in my opinion. But yet this is what companies often go off and do. 
Well, let's come back to culture versus structure. Why? Let's, look, let's peel the onion. What is the incentive of that CEO? He has a boss. His boss is the board of directors. Now, which is a safer bet in front of his boss? Hiring you, a gunslinger, or McKinsey? McKinsey is a really great safe hire for anybody who's worried about their relationship with their board of directors. For example, right. no one, you know, 50 years ago, it was like no one would be fired for buying IBM, which is why everybody bought by IBM, whether or not they had to pay more money. That particular guy who was the, or gal who was the hiring person had a safe career decision. And even if it paid more, it would cost more money that their career yes. was safe. So that, CEO has, uh, you know, and that's one of the reasons the name brand consulting firms, it's not just McKinsey, but McKinsey or Bain or BCG or in banking, it's, you know, Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or whoever. That's why they maintain their premium. Yeah. That's why it's sort of an oligopoly because you want, if you're a CEO, you, you are looking to maintain your job. What's a great way to maintain your job? Hire the name brand safe you know, consulting. Now, do you have to deliver results too? Of course, good boards are looking at both, but you won't be fired for hiring McKinsey. And you're not going to come up with a loon shot, are you? <laughs> you never know. You may or you may not, but that's a lot harder to judge than did you hire McKinsey or some take some crazy risk on something. Now, the converse is that CEOs who feel very confident and are not worried about their relationships and they feel very secure, they will genuinely go ahead and hire whoever they think can do the job that they're interested in. So it's an issue. You know, you know, here's obviously, the thing that I push on yeah. with people, and I learned this from my friend John Bielenberg, the legendary designer. He wrote this amazing book called Thinking Wrong. It's absolute genius. Anyway, what he says is you can always take a crazy idea – and make it more conservative, make it more functional. You can always reel in a crazy idea. What you can't do is take a conservative I, I, idea and make it crazy and innovative. And so when he does workshops at, you know, he teaches a lot at universities and with young people and stuff. And so he does these exercises where he'll say like, okay, the objective is to design a bike. And the number one criteria for your bike is it cannot be rideable. <laughs> and in so doing, he unleashes a, lot of, a, a level of creativity and insanity so that, that who knows what could happen, what kind of a breakthrough, what kind of a loon shot of an idea might come up. And then, you know, he can, you can, if you actually wanted to turn it into a functioning bike, you can reel that in and figure it out. But his, his theory, and I'm curious to test it with you, is that you can't take a more incremental, more evolutionary kind of a, a strategy and make it a loon shot. But I'd be curious what, what you discovered. Yeah, I think that's it. I mean, just let's just take the transistor, for example. You can't really start from a vacuum tube and work your way to a transistor. It's simply not possible. A vacuum, I mean, if you know anything about engineering, they're just like two completely different universes. Well, and you're talking to a guy who's a pretty shitty guitar player, but I, I, there's nothing like uh, you know, a Les Paul through a Marshall tube amp. And I don't give right a there. shit what kind of effects pedals and computers and all that. If it's not coming through a tube amp, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> okay. So the, I think the, you're right. Some of these things just exist in totally different worlds and you can't, you can go one way, but not the other. Uh, but I, I think the basic idea is absolutely right. It's the same thing we kind of touched on in the beginning. If you want to have one good idea, have 20 ideas and get rid of the 19 bad ones. So for me, I use this, uh, that if I probably, if I had one principle that was the most useful principle for writing, uh, I writing creatively, it was F write FBR. So FBR was my mnemonic. That was probably the most useful writing rule for myself. And that was write fast, bad and wrong. Yeah. Yeah. You just, just like, get it uh, on paper, right? It just get, and I think you were asking me, it might have been, uh, you know, I can't even remember when it was, but, uh, you know, all these weird stories and where did they come from? I don't know. I have no idea. I would right. go in the cave, I would lock the door, turn off the lights, blank piece of, you know, blank file in front of me. I'd be reading all this stuff. And if I overthunk it, 
I would just, you know, I would have two words at the end of the day. So I just start writing as, as, as fast as I could, as bad as I could, and as wrong as I could, you know, and I, I wouldn't have the facts, right. And that, you know, as a guy who was trained in pretty hardcore, rigorous science, it's, it's, it's an effort of will to put a fact, to put a statement or a numerical statement or an anecdote on the page where you, you don't go check the date or the number. Yeah. I mean, that's what I did when I, you're a seriously learned dude. You're a doctor. You used to run a pharma company. You're in that world. Uh, that's a world that highly uh, values getting shit right. <laughs> right. So you actually have to unlearn. You have to untrain all your habits where, you know, if you're a public company CEO, which I was, you have to be really very careful and very precise uh, for legal reasons about any word uh, you say. <laughs> there are some examples today of people not following that rule and getting in, in big trouble. Um, but most public company CEOs have got that. You're surrounded by lawyers, both in-house and external, and they're always behind the scenes all over you. Like you can say this, this is in your S3 filing. This is in your S1 filing. This is in your quarterly filing. You can't say anything that's not in the box. Uh, <laughs> out of the box is absolutely not anything a regulatory SEC attorney wants to hear. You want to stay in the box. <laughs> So you learn that. The last so thing you, you want to say on your earnings call is now, um, as it pertains to guidance for the next uh, two quarters, we have no fucking idea what we're going to do on earnings right. here. And you know what? <laughs> That's we just not a good earnings call, right? Yeah. Well, we just put in our quarterly report that was filed this morning uh, before the open market. Eh, forget that. Let me tell you what's really going on. Like literally, guns will come out. They'll grab you away from the microphone. You're done. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. <laughs> so it's exactly the opposite with being creative. You have to unlearn and you have to just go because it's only when you start this like really rapid wheel of, of going down some path and moving really, really fast. You can't stop to check a fact. Yeah. Otherwise you'll slow the, everything down. So a big question I've been dying to ask you, if you're working on a loon shot or maybe loon shots, uh, you know, I, I look to Spinal Tap for, for, for leadership. You know, there's a fine line between clever and stupid. How do you know you should keep going, that you're really on to something? Or h how do you know, you know, we've been working on this idea for three weeks, three months, three years, and it's just not going anywhere. And so, fuck it, we need to go do something else. How, how do I, you know, I'm always, I live in this world, particularly with startups, and, you know, it's like, Everything's a giant, and you talk about this so much in the book in various different ways. Everything's a giant, stupid failure until one day it's this great new revolutionary drug or it's this amazing new uh, way to win a war or whatever, whatever uh, stories you tell in the book. And so how do I, if I'm somebody who's working on these loon shots, how do I know the difference between grit and persistence and pure stupidity? Yeah, the... Uh uh, a guy that I used to work with who was a brilliant scientist and invented a, um, a whole new set of drug categories and absolutely deserved the Nobel Prize had he lived long enough, he used to give this exact talk. He said, how do we tell the difference between stubbornness and persistence? And uh, the one thing that I've noticed is that I used to take a temperature check on myself when I'm working on these things it comes down to a rule that I think of as LSC and I, I don't have a great memory, so I need acronyms. And if I, if I have a little acronym, I can kind of remember it. But LSC for me is listen to the suck with curiosity. So when you have an oh, idea, hold on there, handsome, say that again for me. Listen to the suck with curiosity, LSC. Listen to the suck with curiosity. Okay. Keep going. Let, let me explain what I mean by that. So, listen to the suck is sort of obvious. If you have a product or a project or an idea, whether it's, you know, you're a scientist or an artist or an engineer or a designer or anything you're doing, running a company, an entrepreneur, and something's not working, whether, you know, investors are rejecting your pitch or, or customers aren't quite buying the way you want it or partners walking, that's the suck. And People have been trained. I was certainly trained. You, know, you go to all these workshops and sensitivity sessions and you read any of these books are all about 
uh, active listening is everywhere. Active listening is sort of that, oh, repeat back what somebody said to show that you understand. So that's not enough. So that's where the with curiosity comes from. Because just listening to the suck and repeat, if someone rejects your pitch and you just repeat, I understand you're not buying, thank you. Uh, you know, have a good day. I hope we can stay in touch. You're not buying because you said, but that's not enough. That's not going to take you where you need to go. It's not going to help you figure out the question you just asked, which is, when do I know? You have to investigate with curiosity. You have to set aside the emotional reaction. Most people's reaction in that situation, if they put their heart and their soul into something and investors or customers aren't buying or partner walks away, is these guys are idiots. They don't see what I see. It's going to be huge and they're stupid or they're this or they didn't get that or they failed to understand or they weren't listening or they were too busy or they're just not. And they want to dismiss or attack because what you really want, if, especially if you're a small team or a small company or a leader or the manager or your solo act, you just, you actually want reassurance. You want to talk to your significant other or your friends or your mentor or your mother. I don't suck, do I, Safi? Please tell me I don't suck. (laughs) You want me to say, you just put, you know, God knows how much of your life into this and someone walks away or says it sucks. You don't really want to hear why. You want to hear, no, it's great. This guy was an idiot. That's what you really want to hear. Yeah. So the people who are truly great innovators set that aside. You know, you might take a day to get over it, set that aside, and now put on your detective hat, put on your Columbo hat. Okay, maybe that's wrong generation. Put on your Sherlock Holmes hat and start to get really genuinely intellectually curious. Why did that guy walk away? And see if you can call him back, not in a threatening way, but in a set, you know, be super helpful for me. If you had just five minutes, I will buy you a beer. I'll do this. I'll get you some pizza. Could you just walk me through like what you were thinking? You know, just walk me through your, your decision process. Were you thinking about somebody, you know, some other product out there? Were you comparing my thing? And how did you stack? All of a sudden, you, you just try to find that one little clue. And you may be totally surprised. You know, the, the standard reaction is he just walked away from my beautiful baby, asshole, idiot, go away. I don't want to ever see you again. But it may be when you really probe, some tiny, minuscule little thing rubbed him the wrong way. And it's an easy fix. But you know what? If you don't ever investigate like a detective with setting aside the emotion and just nurturing the curiosity, listening to that suck with genuine, honest curiosity. Yeah. You'd never find that little clue. And it may not be the first one. It may not like a detective. You have to hunt for the little clue. You have to get genuinely, dispassionately, intellectually curious about the suck. Yeah. Why are people not buying? And I, I saw that in science many times. Like the, the guy that I worked with, the example I often use is he he became quite famous for his idea about cancer, about blocking tumor, the blood flow to tumors, and people were working on it, for, and it, it got a lot of attention, and then one lab failed to reproduce the results. And somehow, a, I think it was a Wall Street Journal reporter found out about it, writes this big headline, national newspaper, you know, famous cancer researcher, results not able to be reproduced. You don't see that every day in a newspaper. Irritated, but, you know, that's like a career-ending article in a national. So most people's reaction might be, you know, screaming, yelling, this guy's an idiot. He doesn't know what he's doing. We've got to write. Instead, Judah, the, Judah Folkman, the guy I worked with, set that aside. I'm sure he was angry when he opened the paper and read that. I don't know if it was five minutes or five hours or five days, but I'm sure there was a period, got past that, and then began investigating. He said, could you walk me through minute by minute, what you did when I shipped you those materials. You did this thing, and then you did that thing, and then you did this thing. And only by very carefully investigating did he find out that during the shipping process, when they freeze the material down and then they dethawed it, some of the plastic was leaking into the, the protein that they were testing, the, the laboratory material they were testing and contaminating it. And that was it. 
they fixed that. They found a different way to ship it and everything started working as expected. Yes. So that is listening to the suck with curiosity. It's investigating like a detective. And so that's, you asked, how do you know when to give up? For me personally, when there's no curiosity. Yeah. When I, I've investigated, I don't, when I start just defending like, oh, this is an idiot. That's an idiot. This guy's an idiot. If they're not buying, then I know, you know what? That's a temperature check. Yeah. That's yeah. T- if I, I don't have something the ki- wrong in my theory that maybe is being exposed or my ability to communicate to a certain type of person or audience, you know, there's something off. And it's what I love about what you're saying, you know, as a younger man, I was very much in the fuck you, you don't get it, you're stupid for sure. And, and very combative and all of that. As I have continued to uh, progress forward on the planet, I, I, my level of curiosity increases uh, massively over time. And even in the last couple of years, Safi, doing this podcast and writing the couple of books that I've written, and it just, it's made me so much more of an interested person, even in people, you know, I've gotten into Twitter fights with people who think that, you know, my theories around category design are complete bullshit. I, I want to understand why. Of course, you know, my initial reaction is fuck you. It is. But I'm still, to your point, I'm very curious. Well, why do you think this idea is bullshit? And I don't know, maybe I'm oversimplifying, but I think the root of a successful life and a successful business and a successful career, at least one of the key foundational elements seems to be to me an ongoing profound curiosity about things. Yeah, I always say, every now and then somebody asks me, like, you know, do you have any principles? I, I, uh, and, and that is, you know, for how you think about career or job or personal satisfaction. And uh, I do, and I, I keep it very simple. And again, I need acronyms, otherwise I can't remember it. So for me, it's the four C's, courage, caring, commitment, and curiosity. And that last one, I think it's not only true for when you're, the curiosity is essential not only for when you are pursuing an idea or a project, but for me, it's the same thing about career. When I get up, whether it's Monday morning or every day or every week, and I don't feel curious, that's a red flag. Certainly, you know, I've more or less switched roles often very differently roughly every five years, plus or minus two. And uh, I mean, I was a CEO for 13 years, but the first five or six was private and the last five or six was public. And those are very different and totally different life stages. Um, So that, you know, those count as kind of, but I do think that the the role shifted and kept me curious. Although by the end, I I really had lost some of the curiosity. I kind of... It came beat it out of you, right? Being a officer and particularly a CEO of a public company can beat the shit out of you over time. Yeah, it's just, you know, everybody has a different attention span. And I, you know, I think I really couple to the learning. I, I, what excites me is learning new stuff. And after I think six or seven years as a public company CEO, um, you sort of have kind of got the hang, hang of the basics of the job. You may or may not have gotten lucky or may or not have made good or bad decisions, but in terms of what is the role, um, you know, by your 10th or 13th year, hopefully you've sort of figured it out. Um, otherwise, what are you still doing there? Exactly. But no, the, the curiosity, yes, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, well, I was, I was going to move to a few things in the book, but finish your thought, please. No, I was just going to say, the, the curiosity that you hit on is, is uh, that we were just talking, is essential not only for, is your project going in the right d- direction and you should persist, but also is your life, is your career going in the right direction? Are you curious about your work? Do you feel like you want to learn more? And if not, is it time for a change? Yeah. Now, you tell me if I've thought about this right, but in your book, on one dimension, there's this sort of thread of accidental serendipity of things that is part of what you're talking about. <clears throat> like, for example, why the world speaks English, which I, I would love for you to unpack for me. And yet at the same time, 
you've also weaved through a set of learnings that, you know, maybe, again, you tell me how you want me or to think about it. But on one hand, there's some serendipity and sort of accidental component to this. You know, we try it, we start working on this and it lends it opens that and then this doesn't work, but it fails. And then that open and da, da, da. And, but yet there's also, you're also underscoring some pattern recognition around the sort of accidental serendipitous uh, mistakes, failures that lead to things. And so how, and I do want to get into a few of the couple of stories to bring it to light. You'll tell me which ones you want to talk about, but how do you in your mind juxtapose these somewhat orthogonal ideas of, these big giant breakthrough loon shots have somewhat of an accidental serendipitous component, but at the same time, there are some learnings and some threads. If we want to be a person who's involved with these kind of big breakthrough, what I would call exponential difference um, that we can also use as prescription may be too strong of a word, but there's some foundational elements in here. You're, you're teasing out for us. So how do you think about this sort of juxtaposition of those two things? The, the, the greatest breakthroughs are due equal part to genius and equal part to serendipity. They're a mix of the two. Anyone who says it's all genius is lying. Anyone who says it's all serendipity, well, sometimes they're right, but recognizing a serendipitous event is some element of genius. So they're absolutely always both there. And so anyone who wants to create an environment has got to create an environment that nurtures in equal part genius and serendipity. And so let's, let's talk about, for example, baseball. And so the, when I think about the great managers, I use a lot of uh, business examples there, but just for fun, let's talk about baseball because in some part it's, it, 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 it's, it's related and and it's a, easy to understand the great managers or leaders or entrepreneurs who build um, organizations that can deliver repeatedly creative, innovative solutions and kind of do that with balancing operational excellence like we talked about. They have figured out a, a trick or a system for nurturing the combination of genius and serendipity. So how do they do that? They make these separate homes and they adopt this mindset that I, I'm not going to be the Moses that's picking out the idea. I'm going to be the gardener. My job is to engineer the environment, to engineer serendipity. I want to create the envir environment where serendipity can flourish. You can think of it as I want to create a nursery to protect these fragile baby ideas and then I want to water them. I want to make sure, you know, to protect them so the wolves don't come in and the giant trees and weeds don't come in and destroy them while I'm too fragile. Uh, but I don't want to say, you know what, look at this seed. This seed is going to be this huge, awesome tree that overpowers every other tree in the forest. Not like that other seed next to it. Because the reality, as any great entrepreneur knows, you just have no idea. You're lucky if you can predict where that idea is going next week, not to mention next year, not to mention five years from now. And that's why I have such an issue with people who talk about disruptive innovation. I think that word should be like banished from. Yes. The dictionary. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Fuck disruption. Sorry, <laughs> Christensen. Fuck you. It's, 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 it's about, it's about creation. It's about experimentation. It's, it's not, you know, if you look at a company like uh, uh, Airbnb is an example, they didn't start off to disrupt the hotel industry. They started off wanting to create a whole new paradigm to solve a, a very simple problem at the time, which is I got nowhere to stay in San Francisco. But, but yes, like, and the other one, we talked about this in my first book, Play Bigger. Les Paul was not trying to disrupt the acoustic guitar. That's not what he was trying to do, right? Right. He's trying to create today what we would call a new platform and, he didn't fuck up acoustic guitars. There's no guitar player in the world that doesn't have acoustic guitar and an electric guitar because they're both awesome. You just use them for different fucking things. And so I, really, I couldn't agree with you more. It's time to get rid of this word disruption. It, and it's not only doesn't make sense, it's actually 
not how, if you really go back, we talked in the beginning that it was what, kind of one of the things that was so fun for me is going back and looking at the true histories as opposed to the revisionist histories. Let's take Walmart. You know, any business school case study, oh, they disrupted retail. Well, was Sam Walton thinking of disrupt? No, he just wanted to sell stuff and he was going to open in a St. Louis. And like any big city, like anybody said is normal because you want to sell stuff, you go where people are. It's sort of obvious. It's a no brainer. You get to have a store. Let's go where the most people are. We're going to go to a city. And his wife happened to say, I don't, you know what? I just don't really want to live in a city. I'm done. I, you can open your store, but I'm kind of laying down the law here. I won't live in a town of more than 10,000 people. And it just so happened by not only did he like being married, he also liked quail hunting. And he just, you know, there's a region in the country where four states come together in your Arkansas. And he said, oh, they have four. There's a little corner there and the four states have four seasons and I could just hop and hunt quail all year round. Let's go Bentonville, Arkansas, Northwest, that corner, boom, done. Was he saying, you know what? I think I'll disrupt the industry by going to rural and uh, strategically, but no, he just wanted to shoot quail and his wife didn't want to. Right. So did he say, he opened his stores a little bit bigger because there was more space and he sold stuff a little bit cheaper. He wasn't trying to disrupt and almost all Ikea, you know, they weren't trying to disrupt. They were just, he had a mail order business and the other furniture stores didn't want to let him compete. So he had to open his own showrooms. He got flooded with customers. So you, the guy at the cash register, the first time he opened a showroom was like, uh, you guys just go get it. All of a sudden self-service showrooms was born. Yeah. You know, they were trying to ship it and they couldn't like fit the table in the car because they were such a tiny, he was like, you know what, let's just make the table fold and let the customer ship it. Who the hell knew? They weren't trying to disrupt, you know, right. the point of disruption, any good entrepreneur knows when you're dealing with these baby stage, crazy ideas, the loon shots, it's like a leaf in a tornado. You have no idea where that leaf is going to end up. So the problem with actually, the problem that I have about talking about the word disruption, it's like saying, well, if we put the leaf right in here and it's this shaped leaf, I know it's going to end up exactly 17.3 miles away in the northeast direction. That's just not how it works. The disruption is good in hindsight. If you are a history professor and you are publishing a thesis on what happened to the retail industry between 1951 and 1987, you may very well be justified in using the word disruption. It would make a lot of sense. This thing, these things went away and this other kind of store got there and it was just, but it's fine in high, in hindsight, right. but not for going forward. Well, and I just look at it simplistically, you know, t to the point you just made, which is were the Wright brothers disrupting railways? That's not what the fuck they were doing. They thought it'd be really cool if we could fly. <laughs> That's right. And so you, what you do, you don't disruption. The, the, the reason it's so misleading is if someone comes to you and some kind of guru is saying, this will be a disruptive innovation, blah, blah. By the way, those, that, that phrase in and of itself kind of gives me gas pain just to say it. So the, some guru is kind of waving this PowerPoint in your face. What happens is if you start falling in love with disruption, you'll take your eyes off the ball of those important innovative ideas that are all around you it doesn't matter if they're incremental or, you know what, the transistor, probably the most important invention, as we mentioned it earlier, the most important invention of the 20th century, it was an incremental, they were trying to make slightly better switches. You know, they had these vacuum tubes that they wanted better. And when they first made it, it they couldn't use it for that because they were too unreliable and too expensive. So they, they were stuck. They didn't know what to do with it. The first usage the first place they figured out was five years later, somebody said, well, what about hearing aids? And say, so, well, we can't put a vacuum tube in it. Okay, let's do it. In. So were the guys working on the transistor saying, you know what? Going to their boss saying, I have an awesome idea. Let's disrupt the hearing aid market. Obviously not. Yeah. So what you do is if you're a history, you nurture, you use disruptive innovation in hindsight if you're a history professor. But if you're an entrepreneur or creative, you nurture loon shots to challenge beliefs. All the accepted wisdoms out there, well, they might be right. But what if they're not? Wouldn't you rather find that out 
then read about it in some press release from your competitor. That's why you nurture loon shots and stay away from the disruptive innovation stuff. Is it wrong, Safi, for one man to love another man? <laughs> <laughs> it seems like that was I, so I, well put, man. That was awesome. I, I love it. It's so fucking true. And somehow for the better part of 25 years, and, and look, I don't mean to be shitty to Christensen. I think he's contributed a lot, and, but, but it, it, it got contorted, right? I loved your Adam Smith story about like, he's famous for, you know, um, one thing, but he actually really cared about a whole set of other things that he's not famous for, right? So I, I don't know what Christensen was up to, but so maybe he's, you know, maybe I shouldn't be as mean about that, but I, I, I love, I love that. I think, I think you put it in a way that is, is much more thoughtful and, and frankly, much more helpful to people in their careers and their businesses. Now, yeah. is there, I, I did want to ask you about why the world speaks English, but before maybe we do that, is there one or two of these stories? Cause there's so many incredible stories that you uncovered in the book um, that you wanted to highlight. I, I don't know, man. I'm just sitting here like having some whiskey. So I, <laughs> you tell me what you want to talk about. Right, well, then fuck it. Let's go. Why does the world speak English, doctor? <laughs> so um, I'm glad you asked. Um, the uh, Why does the world speak English? So th in some weird way, that question has been bothering me for, I don't know, if it's almost, it, it kind of bothered me for almost 10 years because I was going around giving this, um, I had stumbled into giving this sort of funny talk, you know, the 3,000 years of physics in 45 minutes, just as sort of like a side hobby on, you know, winter breaks. I, I would go to this uh, one kind of gathering where everybody would talk about something that wasn't their work, and you, you just sort of had some drinks and had some fun. And so I, you know, I'd talk about something that wasn't my day job. And so I thought it was fun to talk about the arc of human knowledge. What have we learned in 3,000 years about how? The world works. What are the eight most important steps along that path? And the first one, the idea that probably changed the course of humanity more than any other idea, what would that be if you are? The idea that changed the course of humanity more than any other one, if, if you want to, want to think about that question, you need to step back, not just five years or 10 years or 20 years or internet or computer or transistor or technology, but a thousand years, 10,000 years, a hundred thousand years. Imagine you're in a tribe and uh, lightning strikes and hits a tree next to you or a volcano erupts somewhere or there's an earthquake or there happens to be a, a drought that year that destroys your crops. How do you explain why that happened? Who tells you what's true? Well, for almost all of human history, depending where you start human history, whether it's 50,000, 100,000, or, or, or all of human history, some divine ruler or tribal leader would tell you why. So authority determined truth. But in the 17th century, plus or minus a few years, in Western Europe, a new idea emerged. And that idea was that there is a universal truth, laws of nature. And those laws are accessible to anyone through careful measurement and experiment. And that idea was radical and it was subversive. If anybody could access truth, what do we need divine rulers for? Why? It was threatening. So that idea periodically appeared over the course of human history over a few thousand years, but it was quashed and suppressed. And the champions of that idea were dismissed as crazy. So that idea, now known by its more modern name, the scientific method, was arguably the mother of all loon shots. It transformed our species. Once it took hold, it democratized truth. 
anybody could access truth, which led to experimenting, which led to tools, which led to not only laws of motion, but the combustion properties of gases and steam engine and warships. And that's why those tiny little countries of Western Europe were able to defeat the much larger empires of China, Islam, or India, because they had these tools of industry that just overpowered anything that these older empires had. So the question is, so I, when I used to give that talk, that would be like my first five minutes or six. That's the first one of the eight ideas. And like, but you know, every time I got there, it was like, well, why Western Europe? Because if you look back at the history, China and India, and, and together with the Islamic Empire, dominated the world on every dimension, not for 10 years or 100 years, for a thousand years, from the middle of the first millennium to the middle of the second millennium, the tiny little nation states of Western Europe were essentially an irrelevant backwater. 50% of the world GDP was China and India. And the average of uh, the top five nation states in Europe averaged like one or 2%. London had 50,000 people when Beijing had a million people. Beijing had been training you know, one or two million scholar elites every year for 700 years before the first university ever opened its door in Western Europe. Not seven years or 70 years, but 700 years. Paper, printing, the compass, gunpowder, gunpowder, advanced mining, agriculture, the Great Canal, the Great Wall, the Taj Mahal. There was nothing like that in Western Europe. All those accomplishments were in China, India, and Islam. The mathematics that we eventually ended up using, much of that came from India and Islamic scholars. Much of the astronomy that was used by Copernicus came from Islamic astronomers. Um, so why Western Europe? So what we have uh, been talking about up until now is how do you nurture loon shots inside teams or companies? But to answer this kind of bigger world history question of why Western Europe, let's step up one meta level. Let's look at, for example, industries. In my industry, in, in new drug discovery, where do the really breakthrough ideas of radically new treatments come from? Well, they come from the hundreds of small biotechs. Not so much the Merck, Pfizer, and virus. You have these global majors, you have the, uh, these big, giant, well-organized, well-funded machines. And then you have the hundreds of crazy small little companies like the one that I used to run, the small biotechs, which are nurturing the loon shots. And you need both. It's an absolutely wrong answer to say, you know, you should, only these are good and those are bad. You wouldn't have an industry if you didn't have both. Because the, the loon shots fail all the time. So if you didn't have the majors there to provide stability and bring in revenue, you would have no industry. It would go bankrupt. On the other hand, if you just had the majors and you didn't have the, you would have, it would go stale. It's fascinating so, how it ma m sort of mirrors tech, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so the Google buys YouTube because you exactly. YouTube doesn't happen inside Google. I don't give a shit what anybody says, right? And Facebook buys <laughs> um, buys WhatsApp because exactly, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the film studios, it's the same. You know, where did my big fat Greek wedding come from? You know, where did you know? It's from the small independent production shops where those crazy ideas were dismissed by all the large majors. So you need both. So why Western Europe? Because at the time, China, Islam, and India were the Merck, Pfizer, Novartis of their day. They were the Columbia Universal and Paramount. They were excellent at franchises. They built this great wall. They built the Taj Mahal. They had incredible agricultural and mining capabilities, which Western Europe, the tiny Western European nations couldn't even come close to matching. But the completely crazy ideas, things like, hey, I got an idea. The earth goes around the sun, not the other way around, like you seem to see in the sky. Or there are these kind of laws of motion. Or, hey, you know, if we squeeze gases like this, we can combust them and they're pressurous inversely proportional to the volume. And so if we do these things, maybe we can 
create this combustion, all of which was connected, all of which was an experiment. And we can discover the truth for ourselves without asking rulers that there's this fundamental truth out there and we can determine it. That was crazy ideas. And they didn't go very quickly. Copernicus's ideas, for example, were ignored mostly for 80 years. I'm like, yeah, that sounds stupid. Because we can all see that the sun is going around the earth. This is idiotic. And P.S. If the earth my ignorance, but did he realize how smart he was during his lifetime or did that come after he was gone? Uh you know, it's an, it's, it's an interesting and probably longer story. He didn't have any data at all. He didn't have what we would call science to back up his ideas. He just, in fact, borrowed some mathematical tools, many, some of which came from Islamic astronomy, and said, you know, if we reorient the mathematics in this way, we can explain all the same stuff just from a slightly different perspective. But neither one is better than the other. His theory was just as accurate or just as inaccurate as the other the greek theory that had been used for 2000 years so he really didn't have what we would call modern science today because he just yeah. had a uh, a you know putting on a different set of glasses for the same stuff and he it was really an aesthetic his view was not what we would call science his view was aesthetic that it just feels more aesthetically natural if it works like this rather than it works like that and people were there wasn't really a lot of opposition. I mean, people thought it didn't make sense because it had flaws. Like we said, the early ideas had flaws. And the biggest one that he couldn't explain is, well, if it's true that we see all this stuff spinning around us because the earth is spinning, well, why aren't birds flung from their nest? That doesn't make any sense. Since you can't answer that, obviously your theory is full of crap. So let's move on. Right. And that's what happened. Like, no answer to that question. Well, let's move on. So shrug. So chances he's like, are his lifetime, he didn't realize how smart he really was. <laughs> no, and it was, you know, he had kind of that insight of, of moving perspective, but he, he really wasn't the first to have uh, that insight. I mean, a lot of people had talked about a, a moving earth. He worked out the mathematics of that better than anybody and took it further than anybody. Um, but he didn't have any data to back it up, and he didn't really try. He didn't really actually do a lot of experiments. We're getting a little off topic on astronomy here. But anyways, <laughs> but anyways the, uh, they were crazy ideas. So in any other place, his stuff would have just been forgotten and killed or crushed. You know, it wasn't until roughly 80 years later that uh, Tycho Brahe and Kepler said, well, obviously his ideas are nuts, but let's just go measure a little bit and see what we can see. And uh, they started seeing, well, there, there's these funny things that we really can't explain with the old theory. And, you know, just as an example, right in the middle of doing that, Tycho had built the best observatory in Europe to do that. His funding was withdrawn. So they, he was on, had this little island from the king of Denmark, and the old king who had been his patron died, and the young king had said to him, uh, well, I'm in charge now. You know, I, I've, you know, we've given you this island to do this stuff, and you've built up this nice observatory. Why don't you come to the castle and show me your specs? And he's like, well, I'm this big, famous astronomer in Europe. Why don't you come to my home? And the young king was like, wait, what? Are you kidding me? I am the king. I'm paying for all this stuff. What are you talking about? And of course, Tycho was kind of an obnoxious guy and didn't have a very appropriately respect. So eventually he got fired. It's exactly like a board of directors and a CEO who's just acting way out of line. He just fired. He said, uh, you're out. It's my island. I'm the king. And you're nuts. So go, uh, more or less. And Tycho was like, wait, what? No, really? What? I'm this great astronomer. He's like, go. You're done, finished, fired. And so he had to hunt around and eventually he hunted around and he found another somewhat crazy king who would support him in Prague. And uh, that's where he built these measurements and that's where they established these little things in the sky. Kepler found the ellipses that no one had ever seen before and realized, well, it, it just doesn't make sense unless you believe this Copernican model. Uh, and then it took off from there that's what newton was explaining kepler's observations 
The interesting thing is something sort of similar happened 500 years earlier in China. There was brilliant astronomer, brilliant observer, brilliant mathematician. But there, when the scientists showed a little bit of attitude, the emperor just said, when he said you're done, he was done. He was permanently exiled, permanently you know, jailed for most of his, the rest of his life. And that was the end of what could have been the scientific revolution in China 500 years earlier. And the difference? China was the Merck, Pfizer, Nevada. So the little ideas will get quashed. Whereas in the small biotech companies or the small production shops, if some CEO loses support from his funders, okay, they take it, the company goes down, he just goes and finds another set of backers. So anyway, the bottom line, why Western Europe? Because Western Europe was the loon shop nursery for world history just as the biotech market is the loon shot nursery for the drug discovery, and just as the small film production shops are the loon shot nursery for the film industry. So that's why Western Europe. And I that's why it. the world speaks English. It is such a fucking insightful theory. I don't know if you're right. I have no idea. It is fascinating to think about. And uh, man, you're a smart dude, doctor. All right. Um, anything else before we wrap, Safi? No, it's been an enormously uh, fun talking to you. So um, hope we get a chance to do this again someday. Hey, man, you're welcome back anytime you want. And from the bottom of my heart, thank you for your brain. Thank you for the years of work and, and, and for writing this fantastic book that I know uh, hopefully many thousands, if not hundreds of thousands or millions are going to enjoy. <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate you saying that. Thanks, doctor. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Dr. Safi Bacall. Folks, um, you know, I just, I say it all the time. I'm stoked to be able to have these conversations. And, you know, another interesting thing I find interesting, another interesting thing I find interesting, yeah. Um, the conversation, the idea of being a good conversationalist is something that uh, for many is a dying idea. And I find it fascinating that dialogue podcasts are bringing the conversation back. It's sort of fantastic that technology is inspiring people to focus on a mode of communication that I would argue is the most powerful and profound mode of communication, which is sitting down and actually looking at somebody and having a non-distracted, awesome conversation. And uh, man, that, that was an awesome conversation with Safi. Now, in business, if you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. And today, more than ever, you want to be on top of the critical, seminal numbers that drive your business forward. So imagine having every critical number you need uh, on your smartphone, on your tablet, anytime, anywhere. That's what NetSuite makes happen. With awesome dashboards, you can stay on top of things like sales and orders and finance and you know your G, your GL if you need to your accounts receivable who owes you money who's paying you who's not paying you who do you owe money to and who do you need to get busy paying uh, and your inventory and uh, even your HR NetSuite is number one in cloud ERP this is an entrepreneurial company founded for entrepreneurs and thousands of the best known entrepreneurial companies and brands use NetSuite to power their growth and drive their business forward. And now it's available to you. So check out netsuite.com slash different. And as a listener to this podcast, NetSuite is offering you a free one hour growth review with an expert in your industry. So why not take them up on that offer? If you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you've heard me talk about NetSuite for a while. And if you've been sitting on your hands, maybe now's the time to, uh, Type in netsuite.com slash different into that URL and, um, and see what happens. Set, up, set yourself up and see what happens. <laughs> because, you know, if you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. And with NetSuite, you will always know. All right. We would like to thank the amazing new book by our friend and today's guest, Dr. Safi Bacall, Loon Shots, How to Nurture Crazy Ideas That Win Wars, cure diseases, and transform industries. It's available everywhere. Legendary books are available on March 19th, 2019. Pick up a couple hundred copies. <laughs> Our good friends at One Life Fully Lived. This is the nonprofit helping you dream, plan, and live your best life. Check them out at one, the number one, lifefullylived.org. 
Now, if you're somebody who wants to um, get more done in your life and really take back what is arguably the most important thing we all have, and that's the gift of time, why not think about a virtual assistant from our good friends at Bottleneck Virtual Assistants? Check out bottleneck.online today. And um, if you want to turbocharge your growth and turbocharge your mind, check out growwire.com. It's what legendary entrepreneurial people are reading today, growwire.com. And um, we have a growing audience in beautiful Australia. And so if you're in Australia and you want to get some legendary marketing design, d- d- done, d- d- design? I don't even know what word that is. <laughs> Check out my friends at Rapid Media at rapidmedia.com.au. And if you're a young person or maybe you're the parent of a young person and you're thinking about potential alternatives to college, uh, why not check out Praxis, P-R-A-X-I-X, P-R-A-X-I-S, geez, Lockhead. Uh, Go to discoverpraxis.com and learn how to launch your career today. And let's not forget the amazing folks at Habitat for Humanity trying to make sure that everybody on the planet has an awesome place to live. Check out Habitat.org. All right, I need to remind you that today's information is provided to you solely for informational purposes. And this podcast is the sole property of the Lockhead Oddcast Network. All rights do remain disturbed. Uh, Remember... All these podcasts go way better with libations. If you want to find us, you can find us at Lockhead.com. You can email us, blackhole at Lockhead.com. Don't forget to support your local loon. Buy John's Crazy Socks. Tell two people you love about two podcasts you love. Uh, Listen to Tom Waits. Remember what he said. Fishing for a good time starts with throwing in your line. And don't forget... The road to success is always under construction. All right. Thank you, Dandy Candy. I love you, Mom and Dad. And hey, Colin, this odd cast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our deepest apologies go out to Kim Kardashian. Sorry, Kimmy. We just ran out of time for you. That's it. Thank you so much, my friends. It means the world to me that of all the options of how you want to spend your time, that you want to invest some of your time with me. Thank Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. And until we're together again, follow your different.